Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast where today we're talking about zero emission heating and specifically zero emission boilers or ZEBs from Tepio. Now if you're thinking why on earth is that interesting? Why on earth should I stick around for this podcast? Well let me tell you just how important this topic is. Now here in the UK, 14% of our emissions are from domestic heating. That is an absolutely astonishing number. And yet just 1% of homes have a heat pump. There is so much work to do. And fortunately, there are people like Tepio coming up with a whole array and a whole host of different solutions. So before we get into the world of zero emission heating, I have two very quick things to tell you. First of all, my name is Imogen Bogle. I'm one of the presenters here on the Fully Charged Show and Everything Electric Show. And whilst I'm incredibly biased, I do highly recommend that you go and take a look at some of our episodes on YouTube after this little, little audio foray. And secondly, I have to tell you about our live shows. Next up, we're at the London XL at the end of March, and you have to come along to see the whole host of expert speakers, to do a load of EV test drives, uh, to try out loads of home energy technologies, and of course, speak to a load of experts to get a ton of advice, regardless of where you are on your own personal home energy transition. And of course, we'll be there. And it's always so wonderful to see you, our lovely viewers and listeners, and to find out what you care about, really. So enough of all of that. All of the important info is in the description box below and, of course, on our website. Over to our topic. Like everything electric? Then you'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Next up, we're in London and Harrogate. Remember... Energy and transport professionals go free on the first day. Johan, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Now, for those who have been watching the channel for a little while, they will be very familiar with you and with the Tepio. And in fact, our fearless founder, Robert Llewellyn, does have a Zeb in his home. But I wonder if you could just kick us off for those who are maybe less familiar to describe exactly what we mean by the Tepio Zeb. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for having me uh, on the show, Imogen. Um, so the the product we've developed at Tepio, which which we call a Zeb, is a plug and play boiler replacement. So we've designed this as a, a simple uh, swap out for an existing um, oil, gas, LPG boiler uh, for a domestic home. Um, and it's a, it's a product that gives you the same heating performance that you can expect from a boiler with um, high temperatures if needed, um, up to 80 degrees, um, but without some of the hassle uh, associated with um, with other low carbon options um, and, uh, and to get, you know, bring that cost of using electricity down um, at the same time as, uh, as decarbonizing. So I think you're being slightly diplomatic there by saying some of a plug and play and maybe some of, less of the hassle compared to, say, a heat pump. And if you could just describe to us why is that? What are some of those kind of key differences between what a heat pump is doing and what the Zeb is doing? How are they different? So, um, yeah, uh, look, uh, heat pumps, heat pumps are brilliant. Um, I'm not going to do any sort of heat pump bashing here. Um, but, but they are, it's a very different solution. So with a heat pump, you take one unit of electricity, um, and you basically use that to, to amplify the heat from outdoors and bring it into your home. Um, and so one unit of electricity will give you say three units of heat to heat your home. With a Zeb, we are um, taking one unit of electricity and we're storing that as a very high density thermal energy inside your home, in, inside the Zeb. Um, and we store um, each product, each Zeb install, uh, stores about 40 kilowatt hours of, of energy. So very dense energy storage. Um, but that is really critical because it means we can buy electricity when it's cheapest and greenest. Um, and typically, uh, time of use or flexible tariffs at the moment give you a three or more to one ratio between the off peak and peak time. So uh, that that price differential means that we can make up for um, sort of the, uh, the you know, against the COP and, and performance you get with a heat pump. So we can meet the same sort of running cost, but we're doing it in a very different way. And so just to check that I've understood this, with a heat pump, you're basically stepping up that temperature, whether that's from the air or from groundwater, and then circulating that around your heating within the home. But yeah. this, with the ZEB, the zero emission boiler, you're essentially using electricity to heat a heat battery, store exactly. that energy up to 40 kilowatt hours, which is 
nuts. I've never really stopped to think about just how big that number is actually. Um, and then that, that energy can be used to, for your heating as and when it's needed. Yeah. Now, as such, have I, oh. Yeah, no, I, was, cause I mean, on the, the storage capacity, it, it is the most energy dense form of energy storage you can buy today. Um, so, you know, most EVs um, will have a, you know, many EVs will have, say, an 80 kilowatt hour battery, which is which is bigger, but it's obviously a much larger uh, uh, battery. Um, but it is critical to be able to get that r- sufficient storage in so that you can actually deliver enough heating on a cold day. Um, and as it is, the um, the size of the ZEB really is suited for up to sort of the median home by heat demand. So a two or three bed um, terrace detached, semi-detached is kind of ideal um, as, a, as a maximum size for the product. And so just I want to check, because we're not talking, when we say battery, it's very easy to start thinking about lithium ion batteries. We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about heat batteries. So what actually is inside the unit? Um, you're allowed to it's, say. I, I, I can say it's not, it's not, too, not particularly secretive. secretive. Um, it's, uh, it's effectively, you can think of it as a high density concrete. Um, it's, it's not exactly, it's a, it's a, um, uh, primarily a product, a material called magnetite, um, which is very similar to what was used in the old storage heaters, you know, from the from the sixties and seventies. But actually, is a really brilliant, low cost um, uh, material with a very low environmental environmental impact. The other great thing about it is it doesn't degrade, so we don't have the issues of um, storage capacity degrading over time. Um, this thing's going to sort of sit in your home for 20 plus years um, and have 40 kilowatt hours of storage in 20 years time. Um, so. so, I mean, it's not the material itself, as you say, was previously used in storage heaters. It's not tremendously crazy innovative with regards to the hardware that we're talking about. But by that logic, are there a ton of people also doing this as sort of Tepio, uh, you know, competing amongst a pretty crowded landscape or are you really out on your own in pursuing this? Uh, we're, there are not many people doing this at the moment. Um, we're the only ones um, really tackling the central heating challenge. Um, there are some complexities around uh, around the hardware. So we have some patterns that cover uh, you know, the way that we're able to store and release that heat very effectively and in a controlled manner um, that uh, that are quite novel. Um, but you're right that actually it's the it's the integration of that hardware then with the cloud-based sort of and the software solution um, that we have that actually enables us to deliver um, the great customer experience and 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 give people a good experience of their heating. Um, there are there are some other companies like Sunamp who who have a great product uses, using using uh, a different type of thermal storage. Um, they're more suited to um, to water um, solutions, so as a water tank replacement. Um, and then people like Caldera, who I know you covered recently as well, you know, they're looking more industrial solutions, partly because of the the size of the of the store, um, making it sort of not that applicable for domestic settings. So, I think that's where we've kind of um, found this. Um, the particular place we want to play, the, the 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 challenge that I set about specifically trying to solve was how are we going to help people decarbonize domestic heating um, when my view was that the solutions available to them were not going to cut it um, for, 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 for every home. home. Um, and so that's kind of where we're, we're playing. So we're the only ones really doing it uh, for central heating. I should say, shameless plug for the Caldera episode, which is on our YouTube channel. And as you say, I mean, it, it's an extraordinary technology. Um, you know, we're talking melting engine blocks and volcanic rocks. And they admit themselves that actually, yes, it's it's way better suited for those industrial processes like beer, brewing, paper making, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Um, but I suppose the principles in which charging up, heating up when electricity is readily available and low cost and green and then using that heat as and when required. And actually, as you were speaking there, it reminded me of something that I noticed in one of our old videos that we've done with you, where you had said the benefit of the Tepio is decoupling generation from usage by having this kind of storage component in the middle. But what I'm intrigued about, and you've, you've kind of touched on this a little bit with regards to the software play, is that when someone electrifies the heat within their home, you know, obviously their gas bills go ideally to zero, yeah. but their electricity bills go up and their kind of usage is much higher. 
And I suppose if you were just to kind of plug in a Tepio without having any of the sophisticated software that goes with it, it could become an incredibly electricity hungry product and could become very expensive. So if you could, could you paint the sort of software picture of how this becomes totally gamified and taking advantage of the varying prices of electricity? Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you if you were to, to take someone's heat demand and just convert it uh, directly into um, uh, using an electrical source, um, so you can do that today. You can put in a direct electric flow boiler, um, which will take electricity and convert it straight into heat for your water system whenever you need heating in your home. Um, it will cost you a fortune. And people, some people do do that um, today. And historically, you know, um, there, I think there are, there are a couple of million homes in the country with heating like that. The problem is that you're using energy for heating when it's most expensive. Um, and actually, you're using it heating when when most of the rest of the country is also using energy for other things um, in the morning and the evenings, and so um, that uh, those peak times a day can be very carbon intensive as ex- and, uh, as well as expensive. So by um, installing a Zeb, what you're doing is we're able to completely decouple the consumption of your electricity when you're using it from the grid or from solar on your roof from when you need heating for your home. Um, and that's key because actually we can reduce the running cost compared with a direct electric boiler by um, three times. So it'll be you know, less than a third the price as if you had a, a direct electric boiler because of that flexibility. Um, more importantly, in some ways, is that we're actually able to, to then heat your home in a way that's sympathetic to the energy system more broadly. So as we, you know, you were mentioning, as we, as we decarbonize and have more and more renewables on the grid, we have less control about when that electricity is available, uh, when it's generated, because we don't have, you know, the gas and the old coal plants that can just turn up and down. Um, but that means we need to make the way we use energy very, very flexible. Um, and lots of your listeners will, you know, will probably have chemical batteries in their home, or they may be using their car to flexibly charge. This is very similar. You know, heating is um, the single biggest, you know, use of energy in your home. But eighty percent of all the energy you use in your home is for heating, um, unless you have an EV. When it, you know, that, that obviously t- um, uh, changes a little bit. But um, it's a huge, heat, huge energy load. Um, and if we can make that entirely flexible, which will, which is what we do with this product. Um, we can make it low cost and low carbon and, uh, you know, avoid those enormous costs that come with um, otherwise, you know, directly um, heating a home with a direct direct electric boiler. God, it is sort of, uh, this sounds like such an obvious thing to say, but I think what I find so fascinating about the world in which we live right now is that, you know, we're borrowing principles from technologies, as you say, not too different different from a um, heating technologies of of years gone by but we're bringing in the world of ai flexible response to electricity uh, resources and having to marry those two worlds such that these things are not only just obviously low carbon but they're really 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 cost effective um but i'm intrigued because is that sort of are you taking advantage of um i'm guessing sort of time of use tariffs and I assume that if someone was to have a Zeb in their home, you would strongly encourage that they have those time of use tariffs so they can buy low use when the, the cost is high. But then I guess at the same time, you're also having to take into consideration how people live in their homes and when they use heat and all of that kind of stuff. And I, So is this system taking in all of those inputs, both of what the broader electricity market is doing and also how someone consumes electricity in their home? How does, how does that work? Yeah, look, you if if you don't have a time of use tariff or a tariff that gives you um, a flexible uh, price uh, for your electricity different times a day, it's not the right product for your home. Um, uh, so you know we should be clear about that. Um, but they are widely available, and if you are an EV driver, you'd be crazy not to get one. Um, the uh, in terms of the way the, the the technology works, is we are so we we use um, a lot of data capture on the device to to work out exactly when you're using heat. So we're measuring that heat going into the home all the time. Um, that goes into a, a machine learning model uh, in the cloud. So we build a very accurate forecast of exactly how your home and you use your heating, um, and that spits out a projection basically over the next tw- you know 24 48 hours, which is continually updated and refined. Um, and then we just throw in whatever price signal. So, you know, whatever tariff you've got, the uh, the forecasted carbon intensity uh, also in your local network, 
Um, and so we can automatically then buy when it's going to be cheapest, but also um, optimal for your usage. So if you don't need heating in the coming, you know, 12 or 24 hours, we're not going to buy any energy um, automatically and store that. Um, so you do need the two to come together to mm. really make the most of the storage. Oh, I've got so many questions. Where to begin? So you're obviously, presumably to make that that come together in a really, really nice and coherent way, presumably you're having to work very closely with those utilities to say, hey, we've got this product. We could be really effective together. How are you kind of looking at that broader sort of ecosystem and forging those sorts of partnerships? Yeah, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a complicated and changing space. So, um, you know, if you talk to different... Um, different people in the industry, they will have different views about how this market is going to develop. Um, our view is we need to be flexible enough to, 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 to suit however it develops and it probably will, will go in different ways. And what I mean by that is, so we work very closely with energy suppliers like Octopus, like Ovo. Um, so we integrate with all the Octopus flexible tariffs. Um, with Ovo, we have um, a type of use tariff actually through um, uh, something called the Neat Heat trial, um, where they actually give us an underlying price signal that we automatically will optimize to and buy energy for when you know when it's cheapest. But the energy, the customer gets a flat rate, which is actually pe- pegged to the gas price. So it doesn't matter to the end customer uh, when the ZEB charges because they're getting, they know they're going to get a low cost of heating. Um, but we can optimize. For, for Ovo. Octopus have taken a different approach with things like Intelligent Octopus, where they want to do the optimization um, of the underlying asset, which is what they're doing with things like EVs at the moment. Um, we also work with DNOs. So the, the other way that things go is that actually the, the distribution networks who are really keen to you know understand the importance of managing the, the load on their local networks really flexibly are also starting to offer more and more local services um, for for flexible products to be able to to, to help them and support their, the local network to avoid grid constraints and you know avoid expensive upgrades to the network. So it's interesting we're working with multiple different players in the market um, mm. to, to to actually find where where we can sort of um, play this flexibility the best. And in terms of what the consumer or homeowner actually experiences, I'm guessing it's kind of like you know duck swimming on water they get a very smooth experience there's lots of kind of paddling beneath the surface on on your side but what's the experience like for someone who's going to buy this do they do they need to interact really closely with their electricity provider for example um absolutely not i mean um they should be aware of of what tariff they're on because you know that that just goes without saying um people should should think about what tariff they're on for their home um but um the whole uh, approach the approach we've taken with developing this product is to to create something that can be as easy and and simple for consumers to 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 adopt. Um, so that requires, you know, I don't know, I don't know if you heat your home with a with a gas boiler. You know, if you do, I'm not sure when. You know, you probably don't remember the last time you actually went and looked at it and, and played with all the settings on it. So you know, if if we're requiring customers to do that, then we're doing something very wrong. And I actually think that the industry has not focused enough on customers um, historically, um, and it's one of the key reasons why we haven't got um, you know a great adoption of low carbon technologies in this industry. I think we haven't done enough as an industry to to really uh, bring customers in and make it easy and simple for them. So yes, big focus on that from, from us. Mm. You don't need to worry about <laughs> you know, when the product's charging. Some customers do. Some people look at their app all the time and they can see exactly when it's charging and they find it very interesting. But, yeah. but many customers don't. Um, and interestingly, we find you know you get quite a lot of engagement early on with, uh, with the app, but for many customers beyond that, they, they trust the product and they just let it do what it, what it needs to do. Mm. And I suppose that's it. It's sort of the very best tech is the one that's invisible and doesn't require any instructions to use. And I suppose our smartphones have set a very, very high standard of this is the kind of user experience that everybody expects. And until fairly recently, things like heating solutions, any sort of hardware appliance that you have in your home hasn't had to kind of step up to the same standard. Um, And I guess as we kind of shift people to new technologies, it's got to feel better as a whole experience than anything that went before it. Um, But you mentioned a couple of things about simplicity and I know the answer to this because I've spoken to Robert and we filmed a couple of things, but I wonder if you could walk us through the process of installation because it does vary quite dramatically from say a heat pump. 
It does, yeah. So um, one of the the really big things that is uh, w- big challenges, particularly in the UK, um, we have is around skills. Um, so we have 130,000 gas boiler engineers in the com- in the country, um, around four or five thousand trained heat pump installers. Um, and those gas engineers often run their own businesses. They've been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, they are very skilled at what they do. Um, but but they uh, they struggle to, you know, they don't want necessarily to make the change to, to things like heat pumps. Um, with Azeb, um, we can train an existing gas boiler heating engineer um, in about three hours to install our product. Um, it's you know, it, I don't want to say it's super simple because you know that is it was reliant on the years that they've had you know um, experience installing gas boilers, but it's very similar to a gas boiler. So you know we we bring in the product, we take the gas boiler off the wall, the Zeb plums into the same flow and return piping, and we run an electrical cable back to the back to the consumer unit, connects to the same thermostat, um, and and really those are the key things that need to be done in the home. So you know typically. Uh, in fact, in almost all cases, it's definitely less than two days. Uh, we can do an install in a day. Um, really excitedly, you know, in the last number of months, we've started to unlock the the distress purchase market, um, and we think that that is really key um, because, like it or not, most people buy their gas another boiler when their current one breaks, um, and when your boiler breaks, it's not really the time when you want to be making a purchasing decision to go to a low carbon heating technology like a heat pump, which might take you a month or so to get in, you know, to get someone to actually come around and install it. The installation process itself is going to take a week plus um, in most cases. Um, so we think that's the really big opportunity. Your boiler breaks, actually, your local installer can recommend something like a Zeb. We can get it to you there, you know, get it to you in the next the next day, and it can be installed, you know, the day after or the same day even. So, um, if we can if we can continue to demonstrate, we can unlock that. I think mm-hmm. it's a really um, really exciting part of you know trying to decarbonize rapidly because otherwise, people like that are putting in another gas boiler. You know, that's mm-hmm. you know ninety nine percent of people when they're in that situation when you just want to heat your home and keep your family warm. The, the natural obvious decision is just to get the same again. You haven't got time at that point to think about, you know, a, a very long process of changing your heating system. That is so interesting. And I think it's particularly interesting when we're sort of at this funny juncture between, you know, early adopters taking this technology because they are deeply interested in it. They have, you know, a bit of the financial means to be able to spend their money in a way that aligns with their values. Robert being perhaps a kind of, perfect example of that and then we're kind of entering into the early mainstream where actually you don't really want to spend money unless you absolutely have to or unless it's going to save you a substantial amount of money and I suppose that is the difference as you described that a heat pump often requires a little bit more thought with regards to does it fit with your radiators are there any kind of other plumbing things that you need to consider and often I imagine the case people are like oh God, now we have to spend the money. We've got to that stage and they want that sort of plug and play yeah. solution. So that's, yeah, yeah I'd not thought of, of that before. You know, often, I often, I, I, I do get into um, uh, heated debates sometimes with, with the heat pump industry and, and, and people from, from that industry because um, it can come across like I'm, I am anti-heat pump and I absolutely am not. You know, the majority of homes in this country have to be heated by heat pumps. Like we can, mm-hmm. it, there's no reason why they shouldn't be. But the biggest challenge, actually, for, of a heat pump install is uh, is electrification of heating. It's actually not. It, I always think about it as like we we think about it as the whole heat pump install is really complex. Actually, it's 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 more about changing the fuel vector, changing someone from a fossil fuel which has that instantaneous energy availability to electricity, which which doesn't, and um and that's the same challenge that we are tackling, mm. and so. The, the really key thing we need to do is to try and get homes as quickly away from fossil fuels onto electric heating solutions in a way that's sympathetic, either by them being super efficient, like a heat pump, or by them being super flexible, like a heat battery, like ours. Um, and I don't think it matters which way we go. I just think it matters that we try and electrify those homes as quickly as possible, because mm-hmm. there are 1.7 million gas boilers installed every year in the UK, which means every year we 
don't transition those homes onto electric solutions is another year when 1.7 million boilers are going to be around for another 14 years or so. So, you know, boilers installed now are going to be until 2040. You know, that it's, it's, it's a really big problem. And actually we can only tackle, we can only tackle this from, you know, by doing it from all angles mm. uh, and providing customers with a range of options, um, which is where we fit in. Yeah. And, and it's something, it's a discussion that we always have on the Fully Charged show as well and have to say, you know, come on, everyone, it's going to be a range of solutions. That is the thing that makes this exciting. There's going to be, we have this opportunity to fit the thing that has, you know, a greater um, use case by use case. Anyway, that is, yeah, yeah we have the, we have the, sa- the same struggles for sure. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that you've mentioned there is that around making this as accessible to as many homes as possible. And we know, for example, that there is the boiler upgrade scheme, which depending, I think, is it £7,500 towards an air source heat pump? Or so I, uh, yes, like yeah. yeah, or ground source or, or water source heat pump. But currently, Tepio doesn't fit within or isn't eligible for those grants. Um which is maybe less of a problem because your product is a little bit cheaper than perhaps than the heat pump equivalent. But I wonder if you could speak to, you know, the grants that currently exist, how they should perhaps be extended to include that broader range, uh, broader array and range of solutions um, and what you'd ask for if you could. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it is, um, it is one of my, big frustrations uh, at the moment, um, although we have a few in this area. Um, so yeah, a typical, you know, a typical air source heat pump installation um, would be about £16,000 um, or there or thereabouts. Um, they benefit from VAT relief, so they don't attract VAT, and then a £7,500 subsidy. So um, that basically amounts to over £10,000 of um, effectively government support for the installation of a heat pump. Um, our product uh, typically can be installed for about £8,000. Um, that includes VAT because we don't get that VAT relief uh, yet. Um, and we also get no subsidy support. So the, the issue we have is um, that for a product which should be less than half the price of a heat pump installed, it ends up as something like double. Um, and um, it's... <laughs> It, that obviously makes it very difficult for us to, to really grow and um, fulfill the potential um, of the technology. Um, but it's also, it, it, you know, it, it should hopefully send a warning sign to a warning to, to um, officials and people within government that if you want to encourage innovation, you have to be really, really careful with how you implement um, uh, market mechanisms mm. Um and correction mechanisms like subsidy, um, like the VAT relief, like the clean clean heat market mechanism that um, may or may not now be being cancelled, we're not quite sure. Um, You know, all of these things um, can be really good at stimulating a market. You've got to really ask yourself a question about whether you are actually doing that at the uh, the peril of other innovations and technologies that can do the job. Um, so that we, we have been talking to, the, we, you know, we talk a lot to the government. Um, they are sympathetic, um, although they have challenges to make changes to the existing systems and, mm-hmm. and, and regulations and policies that they have. Um, but, you know, we, we do need a more technology agnostic approach um, to this to this problem. Yeah, it's fascinating because, you know, you hear often that government shouldn't choose winners necessarily and in making a grant that's very specific in the technology that it's supporting they kind of they're they're alluding to that and perhaps the better policy would be zero emission heating fund and then stricter metrics on what constitutes zero emission heating i'm i'm not sure yeah yeah i I think they i think that the challenges around uh with a subsidy is by nature ends up being specific um it's very hard to make it completely outcomes based and i i understand that you know the the frustrating thing is um that partly the reason why the government's having to offer a a subsidy for heat pumps um in the first place is because we still have um legacy policy and regulation that's effectively propping up the gas industry 
Um, you know, we have this taxation imbalance between electricity and gas that makes electricity more expensive at the moment. It's, you know, it's artificial and it's wrong. Um, we have things like the, you know, this is getting a bit technical now, but things like the standard assessment procedure, which basically will drive, drives your EPC, which are completely crazy that, you know, they still encourage the underlying, underlying, they still encourage the use of gas and fossil fuels over electrification. Mm-hmm. And those are the things that drive um, people to make heating decisions for their home. It's what drives housing developers to, to, to design homes in the way that they do. So, you know, there are changes going on there. But, but so those are, and there are many more examples, mm. but those are the sorts of things that actually mean that the deck is stacked against electrification at the moment. And so the easy option is to put sticking plasters on like subsidy um, to try and fix the problem, but they actually create these other sort of perverse Im- impacts. And is that why the, because there was, and I'm going to get all of these facts wrong, so you're going to have to correct me here, but we obviously had the gas boiler ban was originally planned for 2033. Or something like that, or twenty yeah, thirty nine. It depends who you speak to and when, because it's changed multiple times between I think twenty thirty and twenty thirty five, and sometime in the twenty thirties, and who knows oh. now. Well, this is it. I was like, oh, I'll just double check that fact before we uh, join this recording for this podcast. And I was like, oh my goodness, good grief! I'd forgotten that this is really no. complicated, and that date has moved. But I'm guessing, in the context of what you've just described, of all of these different bits of old policy that need to be undone presumably the easier thing to do was to say well this is a bit hard let's push out that date because we haven't quite got the mechanism to make this really easy um but if it was up to you if if you and i were prime ministers for the day what what would you do (laughs) that'd be pretty good i I, that'd be quite i say say that i think it'd be i think it'd be horrible (laughs) (laughs) yeah i I actually i have to agree i think as as i said oh that'd be pretty good it wouldn't you'd be signing up for of all sorts of headaches yeah. we won't go there yeah. but let's say for this for this one thing we were the prime ministers mm. of um, zero emission heating which we're going to have a very narrow focus because there are many aspects of that job that i would absolutely not want to do whatsoever but we're prime ministers prime ministers for the day looking after the future of zero emission heating what are the things that you would ask for that would make this pathway to having 100 percent um decarbonized heating across the uk to make that pathway really accessible equitable and straightforward not at all ask at all (laughs) wow yeah i mean how long have you got um (laughs) i i I think if if okay if the question is about how do you get to 100 percent um you know electric heating um then the answer cannot be subsidy because um, you're not going to subsidize every single home in the country. Um, So I think that's a short-term mechanism. Um, We have to fix the fundamentals. So we have to make electricity less expensive relative to gas than it currently is. Um, We have to to, uh, reform the energy market, the electricity markets in particular, such that the um, electricity price ends up not being uh, set by the gas generators which is what happens at the moment. Um, so it effectively artificially inflates the price of electricity. Mm-hmm. Um, because I really fundamentally believe that unless you change um, that price signal, then the message will always be to consumers, electricity is more expensive than gas. It doesn't need to be. Um, but so I think I would really, I would, uh, I know it's a difficult challenge and, and you know, the, uh, Rima is, is, uh, is happening to some extent. Uh, they are looking at how they can review le- electricity markets, but um, uh, but it's going to take time. Um, I think I, w- I would also rip up <laughs> probably uh, all the rules that uh, govern uh, uh, that currently govern how we calculate the the heating efficiency in homes within within the standard a standard assessment procedure um, and create something that is less stacked against electricity um, uh, and less in favor of um, of gas um, and I think I think some of those those are probably two of the most fundamental mm. things I would actually change the big the big drivers if you really want to change um, change the direction of travel and in a world in which we've got far more distributed energy resources, so either whether that's community wind, community solar, or let's say suddenly everyone has solar on their roof overnight, surely that really pushes that pressure to say we absolutely have to stop pricing our electricity compared to gas because look at all these people who are generating electricity effectively for free. 
does that become the kind of you know the the pressure point that sort of pushes things in the right direction or is that an extremely naive uh perception um it's not it's no no i don't think it is you know i think um you know you can see what's happening in the solar industry right now it is crazy i mean there is solar going up everywhere you look um Mm. i think it's something like 10 or twelve thousand installs a month in the uk you know 10 times as many as heat pumps um and um, I do, and, and we know that the networks are are very concerned about this because they have no control or visibility about when your home is generating solar energy and, and potentially then exporting that to the grid. And so they really want to encourage people to use um, locally generated renewables um, within their premises, within their home, within their business. Mm. Um, and to to support that, you need flexibility because you don't always need that energy. So you've got to be able to have, you've got to have some product in your home, be that uh, an EV, be that a heat battery, or be that a normal battery to store that energy. And the networks should, you know, they want to encourage that. The government should be encouraging that. Um, but we don't currently, because of the way electricity is priced, we don't currently have the right um, uh, uh, value placed on flexibility. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, d- I do think that actually um, the j- simply the driver of all of this more, you know, locally generated renewables that's going to cause more and more pain for the networks mm-hmm. will actually potentially create that pressure. Uh, for the government to do more to change faster to value flexibility so that we can create the price signals to help people you know self-consume um, their energy um, more readily and and use flexible products like ours i mean that's hugely that's hugely exciting and i think if i'd you know whispered in my 15 year old ear perhaps and said you know in 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 16 years time, you're going to be having a conversation about heating and it's actually going to transform into a conversation about the future of consumption of energy, the future of storage, how we kind of trade and can put different sort of price signals on the market. I never would have believed you. And I think whilst one of the things that I think we've discussed here is the sheer volume of challenges that get us to that point, it's also hugely exciting and actually consumers have a tremendous amount of power to force those signals to the the powers that be maybe um but let's come back if you just just, i I really like that kind of um the way you frame that because if you think about the the world of old where we had centralized power stations everywhere you know these big power stations you know creating all electricity and just flexing to the demand what's happening is each house is becoming its own power station like we are we are putting that power into the into the homeowner's hands and and the the house is no longer this island that kind of just consumes off the grid it's an active participant in that and so all of these smart technologies like the zeb and like you know your ev chargers and that sort of thing um you know make you make you actually an important part of that Mm. um you may not want to be doing that yourself so you'll probably give that over to someone else but but it is really important to think of it like that i think Mm. i um i promise you this is relevant but um (laughs) <laughs> I watched the BlackBerry film the other day and obviously BlackBerry, the the phones, uh, were hugely pioneering in their time, but they were operating in a world where uh, telecoms companies were talking about minutes and sort of maximizing minutes. And then with the advent of the iPhone, it was much more about data. And so the total, the mechanism that made uh, phones and communication profitable totally changed. And it feels like we're sort of at that point in time as well, where kilowatt hours will become our kind of data that we sort of we're not necessarily oh, how do I pitch this in my head we just have an amount of data an amount of energy that we consume and we store and we move around within our whole ecosystem some of that might be in your home some of it might be when you're charging out and about and I suppose what I'm trying to describe is the internet of energy which we all know is is coming and is hugely exciting I didn't invent it <laughs> um <laughs> Let's come back to the Tepio for a moment because the zero emission boiler, as it currently stands, is a is for central heating, but isn't for hot water. But from what I understand, a combi is on the horizon. Is that still the case? Um, I can't say too much. Oh, um, I thought that yeah, might be the yeah. case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, so, so um, yeah, so currently, I mean... Uh, Today, um, people will install a Zeb and then a hot water tank or a, or a PCM um, heat battery to provide the heating. We have been uh, we have been trialing some combi units over the winter, um, and we are 
working on getting the product to market or a solution to market, uh, yes, this year. Um, so it is coming. Um, it's difficult. Um, it, it is it is very challenging, um, um, but we have we have something. We also have uh, very excitingly a product just around the corner, um, uh, which we which we might be launching in the next number of weeks. Um, in fact, you might have to come and see our stand uh, fully charged in uh, in London, um, which will basically allow you to self consume solar um, and store that in your Zeb. Um, oh my so goodness! Our smart, our smart diverted product, yeah. That is super exciting and also i feel terrible that i didn't know this when i am part of the fully charged team the everything electric team putting on the shows but that is a hugely exciting thing which we absolutely need to see in person and anyone who's listening to this needs to come and see that in person as well um ah i should have asked you that at the start why didn't i ask that question (laughs) (laughs) um no it's going to be great look we think that um it's something which we we hope to have done a while back um, you know, there's always so much to do when you're a small business, um, and you want to do everything and, and we're hugely ambitious, but you have to kind of just deprioritize. And, uh, and so we're pleased we've, we've finally got something that we think is, you know, really what customers want. Um, and so yeah, it's going to be, it's exciting. And actually that, that segues really nicely onto sort of the world of being a founder and a CEO of an organization, which is still reasonably new. Tepio's journey began in 2018, I think, officially. But I imagine you had the seedling of an idea for many, many moons prior to that point. Um, I wonder if you could just kind of give us a whistle-stop tour of what that journey has been like, because, you know, start creating any new product is challenging. And I imagine it's been particularly challenging creating a product which certainly 2018 wasn't maybe considered totally sexy or totally easy to understand. <laughs> um, yeah, what has what has that journey been like for you? Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's uh, it's been an incredible one. I uh, would highly recommend it to anyone who you know has got any interest in starting their own business. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, it's also really quite scary sometimes, um, you know, in the, in the early days. So I, I had the idea probably, you know, six months or so before, before starting Tepio. Um, and, uh, in those early days, it was literally, you know, two of us in a concrete bunker with angle grinders developing, you know, the original prototypes, um, you know, within six months we had a, we had a product that kind of did the job ish, um, or at, le- at least provided some heat. Um, but it's a hell of a roller coaster. In those early days, you know, you'd, you'd wake up one morning and think you're going to change the world, and then um, come up against something that you just don't think is solvable, um, and and you know, pack it in the next day. Um, and then, you know, within a within a year or a year and a half, we had something which which we thought could go into homes as a as a trial. Um, um, we grew the team, we raised some, raised some money. Um, and five years later, or now coming up to six years since we started, uh, we've been through several institutional venture capital rounds. Um, we, uh, we have 60, 65 people or so in the company now. So you know, it's still not a big business, but it's, but it, it feels like a massive one when you, when you were, you know, two of you and, um, all those years ago. Uh, so it is an incredible journey. It's also one where you have to, um, I always uh, feel like I have to kind of um, really think about um, my role in the business and how that changes and what the business needs for me at every stage of the journey, mm. because I'm no longer, you know, an engineer developing the product, uh, which I was six years ago. Um, I, I now have to think about our people and about, you know, um, really just about the strategy and about how we're going to um, uh, grow the business. Um so that can be quite. A, I think that can be quite hard for for lots of um, entrepreneurs starting out. Um, that that sort of change in focus, but it's really a fulfilling journey, um, and I can't you know can't recommend it enough for anyone who wants to do something like that. I think I mean I ask this question from a place of of total nosiness because we see loads of different organisations, lots of different technology at different stages within our roles as uh, presents on everything electric and the fully charged show. And, you know, we come in, we see all of like the lovely bits and I quite often step away and I'm like, oh my goodness, 
I cannot even begin to imagine what it must be like to scale from two people to suddenly there are 65 in the organization. You are suddenly like a proper, proper grown up with proper responsibilities. Um, (laughs) But it sounds like the same things, you know, the, the peaks are really high, the troughs are low, but the trajectory is ultimately in an upwards direction. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, it, ha- it has been for us. Um, I think that uh, it's very hard to, it is really hard. So we talked about, um, you know, things like subsidy schemes and regulation and policy. I, I can't think of another industry where it is quite as difficult to innovate uh, and do something different and disruptive uh, as in this one. Um and and so I think you know there was a really good level of uh, uh, I always think about think about it as like enforced naivety. I kind of I think I sort of knew what I was getting myself into. I knew that this was going to be really hard, um, but uh, if I knew what I knew now, it'd be very hard to to do it again. You know, um, mm-hmm. because we are yeah you know, we are trying to do something so so different um, to anything else that that exists, um, but. Uh, but it's paying off, and we, you know, we we are we're growing really rapidly. Um, we've actually just taken on a new facility, which will be opening in the next month to triple or quadruple our manufacturing capacity. Um, uh, we're designing manufacturing here in the UK, which I think is um, is a really a cool thing to be able to do. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's also really uh, it's a really good time to be in this space because, um, yeah, it's definitely heating up. Triple production capacity, you know, no, no big deal, <laughs> big target. Um, so, okay, so you've been on this journey for coming up to six years. What do, what are you looking forward to in the next six years? Where will we, where will you be when we have this conversation in in twenty thirty? Well, we're still. Um, my mission is to to change the way people think about heating, um, and you know, we're on that journey, um, and there's a lot still to do. Um, where I'd like us to get to is that um, if we were talking again in, say, three years' time, uh, it would be generally accepted that um, we have to decarbonize to electrification uh, and people will start talking about hydrogen, which would be wonderful, uh, for heating, that is, um, but also that people accept that uh, that heat pumps or heat batteries are probably the two ways that we're going to, the two key, key options that we're going to have to decarbonize our homes. And as long as people are thinking, you know, when they're looking to, get rid of their gas boiler. I have a couple of options. I can get a heat pump uh, of the different flavors or I can get a heat battery. Um, if people are making those kind of uh, uh, thinking in that way, when they're, when they're think, looking at decarbonizing the heating, I think we will, we will have won um, and, and really changed minds and changed the way people think about heating. Um, with that, we'll obviously hopefully come a lot more Zebs being installed across the country. Um, you know, we do, we do want to do that, um, but also equally lots of heat pumps as well. Well, thank you so much, Johan, for joining us today. Um, I cannot wait to see you and the rest of the Tepio team and, of course, the Smart Diverter, the brand new product that you'll be launching at the Everything Electric show at the end of March. Um, So we'll see you at the London XL. Please support our Stop Burning Stuff Patreon and help us tackle misinformation about electric vehicles and clean energy. That is all that we have time for today. Thank you so much to Johan for joining us on this episode. And of course, you can see Johan and the rest of the Tepio team at our live show at the London XL at the end of March. Now, before you go, I have one teeny tiny favor to ask. If you could give this episode a like, a comment, a subscribe or a share or all of the above, it is immensely appreciated. It helps others find the podcast and helps ensure that we can keep on sharing the important and cool stuff in the world of clean energy and electric transportation. So that's it. If you have been, thank you for listening.